Good morning. In today's class, we will be talking about the political concept of freedom. We will be talking about the definition of freedom. We will talk about constraints, the sources of constraints and why do we need them. So before we even begin by understanding the concept of freedom, we will take two examples. The first example we will take is of Nelson Mandela. Now Nelson Mandela, okay the name is right here. So that's, this is the spelling for Nelson Mandela of his name. So he was a political leader in South Africa. So in the uh, 1970s, 80s, 90s, uh, during this period, South Africa faced a period of apartheid regime. Okay, this apartheid regime was basically a rule of a minority white uh, 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 class uh, race people. Basically, they were uh, uh, Europeans uh, uh, in descent and they were the ones who were ruling. And they created these laws in which there was complete segregation of uh, the native people or the black people, the colored people, vis-a-vis -vis the white people. So the segregation was based on race. The segregation became so profound, so severe that the black people were kept uh, you know, uh, in particular parts of the town. They did not have the freedom to move easily in different parts of the town. They were restricted to only certain schools. In some cases, they did not have access to education at all. They could not use uh, public transport. They could not use public parks. They could not uh, use public any institutions. Uh, they were also not given the freedom to marry anyone they chose. So in case uh, a black person fell in love with a white skinned person, they were forbidden to marry. Okay, the children were not recognized. A very famous example of a colored or a mixed race child today is Trevor Noah. He is a famous TV personality in the US nowadays. He has written several books talking about uh, his childhood uh, in the apartheid regime, regime wherein his mother was a black woman and his father was a white skinned man. Uh, but again, going back to the separatist policies that were followed during this time, the lack of freedom that the black skinned people have uh, led them to not only become impoverished, uh, but also highly unemployed. The literacy rates, uh, illiteracy rates were very high. Uh, they were not given their basic, mini basic minimum requirements such as clean water, clean, proper food or even decent housing. In this light, we, we see the rise of a political leader of such as Nelson Mandela. Now, he uh, fought against these policies in a non-violent way. He protested against them and he soon became the leader that the people chose, right? But as a result of his popularity, as a result of his protest, the white government in South Africa put him behind jail for more than 20 years and he was imprisoned most of his uh, uh, imprisonment life in solitary confinement, which meant that he could not even talk to someone. Okay, he was completely alone in the prison. But sitting in the prison, he wrote a lot of books. He talked about freedom. He talked about the future of South Africa that he envisaged. And one of those writings form formed his book, which is known as Long Walk to Freedom. In this, he talks about his fight to gain freedom against these separatist policies. His fight to gain freedom 
so that all people regardless of their race could exist peacefully there would not be these artificial obstacles in the society for which people are denied their basic freedom right so he after you know um, getting freedom from the jail from his imprisonment he led the final uh, protest in through which the uh, a national government was formed and he became the leader of south africa and uh, the new constitution of south africa completely abolished any segregation based on race this ended the apartheid regime re regime uh, formally but again going back to his understanding of freedom nelson mandela's context of apartheid his context of living in a time where segregation was made on race identity he he realized that freedom is one of the basic basic requirements for humankind he realized that it that a man needs to be free to lead a dignified life right so this is where his understanding of freedom is and he then talks about all the struggles he goes and all the sacrifices he makes just imagine living in a jail for more than 20 years without even interacting with the outside society uh, you have to give up on your favorite food favorite sports favorite all your favorite activities in this light you are you know pursuing and constantly struggling to gain freedom right so that is his perspective of what is freedom we move to a second example she is ong san suu kyi a leader in myanmar now her struggle for freedom started against the military junta in myanmar myanmar is a neighbor of india right so she was imprisoned in her house she was house arrested for decades she was separated from her child she was uh, separated from her husband who was dying of cancer she was arrested and she did not have the uh, uh, liberty or the freedom to even go and step outside to meet her family because she knew that if she ever left myanmar she would never be allowed to come in and she understood that her freedom is associated with the freedom of the people if she is free and then she can you know if she gets that freedom so will her people so will the people of myanmar so she associated freedom with freedom from fear so let me read a a very very important line from her book freedom from fear for me real freedom is freedom from fear and unless you can live free from fear you cannot live a dignified human life so she doesn't blame anybody she doesn't blame uh, a military or a dictator or uh, you know uh, circumstances economic growth she doesn't blame that she blames the fact that we humans keep fearing we fear that you know something is going to affect us we are going to live a a, a life that is dreary we are going to be uh, you know our life is at stake that fear constantly makes us uh close down on our freedom okay so let's say we have the freedom to talk but we are scared that the government might uh put us into jail for what we speak or you know we are uh, we have the freedom to uh you know wear something that we want to but we are afraid of what the society will say so that fear stops us from exercising our own freedom and that is what she talks about she talks about freedom from fear right and this is her perspective of what is freedom now when we look at both the examples of freedom we understand that there is something very common to both the examples that is freedom is basically 
absence of constraints. This could be any kind of obstacles. It could be an obstacle of government laws, it could be an obstacle of discrimination, it could be an obstacle of fear. But when we say freedom, we are basically talking about absence of constraints. Technically, we can say freedom, and this is the definition of freedom. Freedom is the right to act according to one's own will without being held up by the power of others. So basically it says that one is free to make one's own choices, right? Without the interference of any other. So now let's go to understand the definition of what is freedom. So if you look at the previous two examples, there is something very constant in it, right? And that is absence of constraints. This is a basic understanding of what is freedom, right? Constraints is basically obstacles. So in the case of uh, Nelson Mandela, the obstacle was segregation policies. In, this, in the case of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, the obstacle was fear. Obstacle was the military junta. So basically, when we say that there is an absence of constraints, we are talking about absence of obstacles. It could be anything, right? That is in the broadest sense what freedom stands for. So another aspect of this is basically when we say uh, freedom is also to do what one chooses to do, right? Freedom is all about choosing one's own will. Choosing to do what one wants to do, right? So that there is no obstacle, there is no influence in telling you what to do. Instead, you use your own rationality, you use your own reasoning and do what you want to do, right? That is the application part. But technically, if you look at it, freedom is defined in these words. Freedom is the right to act according to one's own will without being held up by the power of others. So the two concepts that are very important here is to do what one's own will, right? What you want to do. The second part is without being held up or without an obstacle, without a constraint that is put by others. This could include already established uh, traditional obstacles, historical obstacles, social inequalities, uh, political, inequ uh, political uh, constraints, legal constraints and so on, right? So there are these powers of others that should not influence you, should not stop you from doing what you want to do. And that is what uh, freedom is all about. Now, if we look at the types of freedom, uh, there are multiple right? We can talk about physical freedom, uh, which basically means nobody is imprisoning you. You are physically free to move. There is moral freedom. Nobody is influencing your moral decisions. You are yourself uh, thinking what is right, what is wrong. Then there is uh, political freedom. You have the freedom to choose your own representatives, to exercise your right to vote. And then there are uh, Psychological freedom. Nobody is creating fear inside you. There are social freedoms. Uh, that is freedom from inequality uh, such as gender or caste. Uh, then there is economic freedom. That is to exercise, uh, to, to uh, choose what one wants to do in the, with one's own economy uh, or uh, property, money, whatever. So there are these various forms or various types of freedom. Again, to repeat, freedom is basically to look at absence of constraint. Now, there are two concepts that are very important to this idea. Okay. So, one 
I just said absence of constraint. So let me just qualify it and say absence of Okay, so absence of constraint and domination or domination and the other aspect is uh, So one is absence of constraints and domination. The other is the abil uh, other is the ability to freely express and pursue one's own benefit, because this will allow us as individuals to grow. This will allow us individuals to uh, develop our skills, our abilities, to uh, develop our capabilities, uh, to grow as an individual, and thereby improving the society as a whole right so on one hand we are saying absence of constraints absence of any external influence and on the other hand we are saying that freedom is also the ability to express oneself ability to follow one's own pursuit or follow one's own self-interest so that we as individuals can develop later in the lesson we'll talk about negative and positive liberty uh, which flows from these concepts but for right now we have to understand that freedom comes from these two criterias even though these two criterias uh, look very different but they work together right uh, and only then we achieve what we today understand as freedom so if a nobody is influencing us nobody is dominating us nobody is restricting us and we are able to follow our own interest pursuits so that we as individuals grow only then we achieve what we understand as freedom okay so this is what how or how we can define freedom now let's come to understanding what is a free society now free society would be one which enables all its members to develop their potential with the minimum social constraints so basically what I just did in this statement is I combined both these criterias that is freely express and pursue one's own benefit and absence of constraint and I said a free society would be one which enables all its members to develop their potential with the minimum of social constraints. So one we have to understand that in a society there is bound to be constraints. There is no society which exists without constraints uh, and these constraints could be external that is societal that is people who are putting it on us imposing on us or it could be something we ourselves create we ourselves feel that this is not right so i will not do it okay so these sort of constraints are always present in a society so one has to understand when we define a free society we are talking about working, we are talking about thinking, we are, uh, we are talking about uh, doing something which has minimum social obstacles or minimum social restrictions. Okay, uh, like for example, if we say that uh, I, uh, I uh, have the talent of being a good dancer, and the society should pro society should accept the fact that I can dance, right? And there are, I am able to reach that potential of becoming a good dancer. There should be no restriction on me for that. Nobody should tell me that, oh, dancing is only meant for girls and not for boys. Nobody should tell me that dancing that is not a good career choice. Dancing does not give economic freedom. So these constraints should not be there on me. Instead, as a free society, I should be able to develop my potential. And every individual has his or her own potential. 
Potential does not always mean talents, right? It does not always mean the fact that you either have to be a good singer, dancer, uh, writer, or a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, any, any kind of talent. It does not just mean that. It could also mean a potential of being a good human being, okay? A potential of being uh, a good citizen, right? So, the potential should not be understood only with talents or um, hobbies or something like that. It is the potential as an individual to grow, right? And every individual has that. So if we define a free society, which is something that we call as ideal, then we are talking about a society wherein there are minimum social restrictions so that a person can develop his or her potential to the maximum. Now, uh, there are a couple of points that one has to point out, okay? Uh, when I'm saying minimum social constraints, I just mentioned that society always has constraints, right? And uh, it is up to us at the end of the day to understand or to figure out what kind of constraints is okay for us. Whether we are going to accept a constraint by tradition, which says that by tradition, this is not good for you. By tradition, this has only been done by girls and this has only been done by boys. Do we accept that constraint? Uh, do we accept a constraint that some that our parents are putting in for us? Like, you know, if our parents say that, you know, you have to become a doctor or you have to become an engineer. Do we accept that constraint? Uh, do we accept a legal constraint which tells us that, uh, you know, you have to do this before you can even go for this option or uh, legally you are required to do this. So do we accept that constraint? And as a society, as an individual, we have to understand, accept and reject these constraints, right? And it is important that this these restrictions that are um, in place uh, is constantly challenged by the individual. Because if we don't challenge them, what is happening is our own freedom is getting uh, narrower and narrower. If we accept what the society is telling us, if we accept what the political system is telling us, if we accept what is being told to us constantly, then we ourselves are harming our own freedom. So we have to constantly challenge it. We have to constantly be vigilant about it. Only then our freedom is secure. Only then we have the right to do what we want to do or we think is rational. Okay. So that is one concept that we need to under, uh, remember. The second thing that is important is to understand that these constraints are between an individual and a society. These constraints are not between individuals and individuals. They are basically between society on one hand and between individuals on the other hand. And every individual perceives these constraints differently. Okay. Uh, some people want because they feel that these constraints give them protection. Uh, like for example, you know, there some people feel that the legal rights that are there, it provides them with protection. Some people feel that these legal rights are curtailing their freedom. So there are different perceptions about these constraints. And you as a student of political theory, you as a student of humanities, has to come up with your own understanding of what you think are justified constraints and what you think are unjustified constraints. Okay? Moving on. We'll talk about the concept of Swaraj. Now, Swaraj comes from two words, Swa and Raj, okay? Swa means self, Raj means rule, right? And Swaraj was a rally call during the Indian freedom movement, especially by Bal Gangadhar Tilak, who said, Swaraj is my birthright and I shall have it. At this point of time, the freedom movement wanted Self-rule or home rule, which basically talked about, let me just write it here, okay? So basically, if we look at Swaraj, there is rule 
of the self which is what the rallying point of the indian freedom movement was wherein they are saying that we as indian citizens have the right to rule over india the rule of the self we are going to be the rulers right swaraj that is home rule again that was the rallying point of the indian freedom movement uh later on in 1909 mahatma gandhi gives another connotation another interpretation of the word uh swaraj in his book hind swaraj when he says swaraj also means rule over self okay so one is rule of the self and the second is rule over self in which he says mahatma gandhi says that if we control ourselves if we understand what we truly are if we understand our inner self only then we can improve the society right if there is self respect uh, self development of capabilities uh, atmanirbharta right only when we ourselves are truly independent if we truly are free if we can control over us in a self only then we as individuals as well as society will progress right so the concept of swaraj uh, has a very very similar meaning uh, to what we understand as freedom in western political thought in indian political thought it is swaraj right and to repeat myself there are two aspects rule of the self and rule over self rule of the self means when you are talking about independence you're talking about freedom uh in the uh, negative sense that is absence of constraints in rule over the self means ability to grow as an individual ability to express oneself and that ability comes only when we understand our inner self right so this is again a concept in the indian political thought which which is almost similar to the western political thought of freedom moving on we come to sources of constraint but before we do this let me just briefly describe constraints constraints can be defined as i've already used the word obstacles but technically it can be defined as restriction on individual freedom okay so this is how we usually define constraint as now when we say sources of constraint there are multiple sources of constraint the number of sources are equal to the type of constraints so if we talk about economic constraint obviously the sources come from economic inequality of the class system that is present right so the class system constrains us from accessing certain resources and opportunities if we talk about social constraint we are talking about the caste system or the gender inequality and so on right so the inequality in the society is creating a constraint for us to exercise our freedom uh so like that we have political uh constraints we have moral constraints so on so forth but one of the major constraints that we as individuals today in 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 a democratic country face is that of domination or influence by the government through laws so through laws the government is constantly creating constraints on our freedom right with a law such as uh, you know one cannot uh, you know uh, one has to follow the traffic rules right it is for our benefit 
but it again curtails our own freedom right we have to follow them uh, we do not have the freedom to drive the way we want to uh, the law so uh, so that we uh, to prevent us from um, you know ex uh, exercising our freedom to express ourselves right so there are a lot of these laws that are there which are basically influencing us they are basically creating constraints on us and this is where today in democratic society we talk about the battle between constraints and freedom now just uh, as a, as a as a uh, side note the importance of democratic state is right here if it was a monarchy if it was a dictat uh, dictatorial state if it was a uh, oligarchy state then these states Uh, are absolutely governing people right there is no space for people to push back and because of this the freedom of the people are also curtailed right and that is why we in political theory and political science uh say that it is better to have a democratic state because it at least provides protection to people's freedom right uh and there are ways of doing it right the people do create a, a, a push back when certain laws are created people do participate in decision making there is some kind of legitimacy uh and authority issues that come up in democracy and all of that but understand this in a monarchy such as saudi arabia people cannot express themselves in a monarchy such as thailand people can't uh, criticize their own king or or their own uh, monarchy right in a dictatorial country such as saddam hussein's iraq you could not speak against what the legal laws were so there's complete curtailment of freedom right but in a democracy that does not take place Yes in some cases we do have instances of emergency laws and we do have instances where special laws are created to curtail freedom but again that is an exception to democracy not the rule uh so in a democracy that that is taken care of now it is important even in a democracy that people are aware of what these constraints are again to repeat myself it is important to understand where these constraints are coming from uh is it for our own benefit or is it uh for the benefit of the government these questions need to be answered these questions need to be evaluated so that there is a proper understanding of the constraints that are put by the government on us right that is the citizens of india uh the citizens of a country okay so again these are certain sources of constraints moving on why do we need constraints every society needs constraints okay uh, the reason behind it is very simple if we don't have constraints there would be absolute chaos uh because everyone every individual has the freedom to think they have the freedom to have their own opinions they have the freedom to follow their own beliefs and when that happens we feel that our opinion is the correct opinion vis-a-vis -vis the other right in a society this leads to a lot of chaos it leads to a lot of fight so let's say i believe that the proper way of crossing the road is to look left right left and then cross the road but you might feel that it is not necessary it is only you know you just need to look at the light and just cross the road you don't need to look left right and left so there is a differing opinion right here usually this kind of differing opinion can be resolved through discussion but sometimes in a society this discussion moves towards rage or open violence people start fighting over these minor issues so you have road rage you have rage over parking spots you have fights over throwing garbage in a wrong place you have petty fights which in a moment's time just becomes or escalates into huge issues so when that happens violence is inevitable in newspapers we see so many examples of people killing each other for petty issues of road rage 
for petty issues of fighting or you know calling someone's name you know and so on in a ideal society we are talking about solving or resolving differences of opinion through discussion but that necessarily does not take place that is where we need restraints that is where we need legal and government governmental constraints which uh creates protection for people who face such violence which punishes people who are involved in such uh violence and which creates laws that prohibit people from this kind of violence okay so that is one of the reason why we need constraints the other reason that we need constraints is that human beings are you know in independently they are very rational but the problem is with this rationality comes uh, other issues as well we feel that the other person's rationality is inferior to us and sometimes we try to impose our own opinions on the other so either we do it by force we coerce the other person or we you know publicly criticize that person until and unless the person accepts our viewpoint and this is where it becomes difficult to express oneself because at the end of the day what you are doing is you are exercising your own freedom by taking away someone else's freedom of thought right so again right there we need a constraint we need a constraint which does not force someone view on the other right there is freedom so that everybody can exercise their own freedom of thought and belief without imposing it on each other so that is second reason why we need constraints the third reason why we need constraints is that there is a need for structure with so many opinions with so many thinking process we need something or a some structure to come up with a majoritarian opinion you right to for the society to function in a particular way the third point is in a society there are so many differing opinions right we all have our own opinions now we need somebody or some institution which is going to negotiate these opinions and come up with an opinion that is accepted by all or majority so in that way uh, you know basically we are trying to create a majoritarian acceptance for certain rules and regulations and therein lies where again a need for constraint uh if we do not have that and we all continue to exercise our own free will our own free choice again we are moving towards chaos uh we need some structure and therein again lies why we need governmental or legal constraints sometimes even historical or traditional constraints do give this structure do give this uh you know uh, helps in negotiation uh to get a majoritarian opinion so there are these reasons why we need constraints in conclusion to today's lesson what is important to basically realize is that freedom comes with constraints it is us as individuals to minimize these constraints because more the constraints the lesser our freedom is okay and it is up to us to minimize these constraints and to in increase our freedom but to do that we have to improve ourselves as an individual and as a society we need to respect everyone's freedom we need to accept and respect each other's differing opinions we need to accept the differences because if we don't accept the differences and there is violence there will be more and more constraints on us so at the end of it it is up to us as individuals to understand respect and to you know give space to everyone's freedom with that we are actually decreasing the number of constraints and thereby our freedom is uh, secure you know uh, let me give an example here if the cases of road rage starts decreasing if people drive in a proper way you know with proper lane driving less of honking and all of that we do not need so many police vans on the road 
we do not need so much of surveillance on the road we do not need so much of government restrictions on us if we understand that you know we are free to drive but we should drive in a way that doesn't impact the others okay so that is very important anyway let's quickly recap what we learned today so we started off with two examples that of nelson mandela and uh, ong san suu kyi and then we moved on to the definition of freedom right with this we moved to understanding swaraj and then we came to constraints we talked about different sources of constraints and we talked about why we need them okay and with this we conclude our today's lesson thank you